Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Thank you for uh, this uh, invitation, which is uh, extremely flattering. Governor Kuroda, dear friend, Governor Glapinski, all friends that are here, I am very, very happy again to be, to be here once again in uh, Japan and in BOG. It's a, a, a very great honor, as I just said, to hold uh, the Mayekawa lecture. And uh, I am impressed by the previous uh, speakers, Professor, that you just mentioned. Let me say just a word on uh, the fact that uh, since the very beginning of my career, I was lucky enough to know personally, to work with, and to appreciate the wisdom of six governors of Bank of Japan. I had this privilege with governors Yasushi Meieno, Yasuo Matsushita, Masaru Ayami, Toshiko Fukui, Masaki Shirakawa, and Aruiko Kuroda, which I <laughs> knew long before he had this position here. Uh, and of course, it is because I had the privilege to be Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Governor of Banque de France before being President of the ECB. But in all those positions, I was struck by the convergence of our views in very, very difficult and demanding circumstances, by the fact that our diagnosis and recommendations were often closed due to similar features of our respective cultures, including the trust that a solid and pertinent diagnosis by public authorities, including central banks, could really make a difference at a continental and global level. And it is in having in mind this long-term cooperation and joint inspiration with yourself, Governor Kuroda, and your predecessors that I am starting this lecture. A word uh, first on, and you won't be surprised of that, on the historic endeavor of the European. And then I will concentrate a little bit on monetary policy and what I perceive as uh, a very important convergence that has been observed in the crisis and in my understanding because of the crisis we had to cope with. But let me say first, when reading academic works, published observations, articles signed by specialist journalists, as well as articles for a large public, coming particularly from non-European countries, there is often the remark that the euro had been a disappointment. The single currency economic performance is supposed to be poor, very poor, particularly in comparison with the USA. The impact of economic monetary union on public opinion in member countries is deemed, was deemed negative, dividing countries and eroding confidence in the European project. It was so disseminated in, uh, I would say, the, the global media, global articles, global observers, that it appeared as going without saying in many cases. I think I you would not be surprised that it is a wrong view, which does not represent reality, is deeply misleading, and can drive uh, leaders, economic agents, uh, private markets, foreign governments to make wrong decisions. The fact that there is a significant international view which is not really correct does not really surprise me. Uh, the existence of a certain negative bias against the single currency has been observed since the inception of the euro. I don't elaborate more on that, but I would like to tell you what are the four following points I will concentrate on. First of all, I will make the point that contrary to many negative predictions, the euro as a currency has been a success in terms of credibility, stability, and resilience. And the resilience itself is due, in my understanding, in particular to a large popular support, which was not really expected at the very beginning. The euro area is more of a success in terms of real growth measured during the period starting from its inception until today. That also is not understood or uh, deep, uh, generally recognized, but I take it that I can demonstrate that. Still, the appreciation must be more nuanced as regards nominal and real convergence inside the single currency area. I would also make the point, and I'm very strong on that, 
that in a medium and long-term perspective, EMU calls for further very significant reinforcing uh, its economic, fiscal, and financial governance. A lot, a lot remains to be done, and uh, I take it from the past success, uh, more, uh, I would say, assertion for uh, what remains to be done and uh, will be done in my understanding of the historic process. Now, drawing a number of lessons from the crisis, I would also make the point that the ECB, together with many other central banks, I would say all central banks of the advanced economy, and certainly Bank of Japan, actively participated in what I would call conceptual convergence of policy making in advanced economy central banks. That convergence doesn't mean that we all agree. It doesn't mean that we have all converged towards a single concept. On the contrary, I would say, it means that uh, we are agree on the questions that are asked and posed, and Governor Kuroda was pretty eloquent in mentioning the open questions. And uh, I would say uh, also uh, bravo uh, for uh, having organized this conference on the pertinent questions that are uh, uh, the real issues for the central banks today. Now, let me also say something on Europe, which I draw your attention to. Very often, what I see as a judgment on the European historic project is based upon the idea that it is a short-term experience, a short-term experiment. And you have a lot of reflection which uh, are generally concluding that uh, uh, negatively on this uh, experiment. But I would draw your attention to the fact that it is a historic long-term endeavor. And uh, only to give you an idea of the duration of this uh, historic uh, endeavor, uh, in the case of the United States of America, I counted 120 years in between the first Coinage A Act of 1792 to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, 120 years of maturing for a fantastic historical project. And uh, from 1913 up to today, we have a new uh, process uh, of uh, around 105 years, which is uh, six years, which is not uh, a, a short period, so all taken into account, more than 200 years. So I don't suggest that you should judge what we do only uh, with the yardstick of 200 years, but uh, to stick to uh, 20 years would not be enough, again, to understand the development of history in the making, which is the case. Now, let me concentrate first on currency credibility, stability, and resilience. As regards credibility, uh, we started from scratch, as you know, in January 99. The idea was that it's very unlikely that uh, the uh, euro will hold a reasonable, uh, reasonably stable position, uh, taking into account that uh, you are merging the Dutch Guilder, the DM, on the one hand, the Escudo, the Peseta, the Lira, on the other hand, so you will have some kind of average behavior of the currencies that are uh, merging. And the idea that it could be a very stable and credible currency was not uh, in the air at the moment of the setting up of the euro. Uh, we started uh, the euro dollar at the level of 1.17. Uh, today, we are not far from uh, this uh, uh, inception uh, rate. Uh, and I have to say that uh, it is uh, very, very impressive to see that uh, during the 21st years of the euro, there were several periods of time when the euro was uh, considered much too solid, much too strong, <laughs> even when I was myself president of the ECB, which was a, a little bit paradoxical for a currency which was deemed to lack credibility at its inception. Uh, so I think that uh, there is no uh, dispute that the euro is credible, that the euro has maintained and is maintaining uh, stability at, on the exchange rate level, 
And as regards the uh, international credibility and success of the new currency, I will give you very rapidly some facts and figures. It is the second international currency after the dollar, represent 23% of international debt outstanding, 62 for the dollar. Even in terms of global payment currency, it represents 31% approximately, not so far from the dollar, 42%. It is something which is not uh, generally recognized or even understood, uh, this position as regards the global payment currency. And as regards Forex, for, for foreign exchange reserves, it is 20%, approximately one-third of the U.S. dollar. So I think that it is not disputed that the euro is the unchallengeable second most important international currency. The yen is the third. And we have, uh, in that respect, uh, of course, uh, an international monetary system that changed structurally with the uh, setting up of the euro quite radically. Of course, the yen, the dollar, and the euro have to understand that uh, one time will come when the renminbi will take also its own position and, of course, it will uh, introduce a new radical uh, change in the, I would say, uh, structure of the core of the international monetary system. As regards stability on top of uh, credibility, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, we had, since our inception, a definition of price stability which was... Uh, uh, less than two, then we, uh, we are very clear in uh, clarifying that it would be less than two but close to two in the medium run. It was done in 2003. Uh, at the time, uh, Otmar Ising, who uh, delivered a lecture here, professor, uh, was um, the chief economist, the responsible for the economy in the executive board of, uh, of the ECB. And uh, I think it was uh, important that we would say less than two, but close to two, in order to avoid any understanding that we would be complacent vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, deflation. Since its inception from uh, 99 up to 2018, the average euro area inflation is around 1.75%. And of course, it's a, a result in line with the price stability, which again, I, as I said, credibility was not, uh, I would say, the consensus for the euro was not a consensus amongst the observers at the very inception. Again, the price stability was not a consensus at the moment of the inception. And uh, uh, it's important to understand that from that standpoint, we uh, delivered what was expected from the ECB and from the euro by uh, all the fellow citizens of Europe because it was of course, as you know, one main element in the uh, Maastricht Treaty, this idea that we had to deliver price stability, primary mandate, deliver price stability. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that we should be close to 2% every year. There are years where we are below 2%, and it is the case, clearly, in the most recent period. There were periods of time where when we were over and above 2%, when I left myself the ECB at the end of 11, average 11 inflation rate was 2.72%. So we were, you will say perhaps, uh, <laughs> Governor Kuro, that was the happy time <laughs> where we were over and above 2%. But uh, in my understanding, of course, um, we are reasoning medium term, medium long term, and uh, it is not, uh, it is not a right and appropriate understanding what we are doing to think that uh, having a target or a definition of price stability means that you must be in two years' time exactly at your target. It's more complicated than that. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned the average inflation over a certain period of time. Even for, for a currency which started 20 years ago, it's easy to say this is the average inflation over 20 years since we started the currency itself. Uh, now, what, again, I understand myself is that there is a consensus in all central banks to consider that the real success is to solidly anchor inflation expectations in the medium, even medium and long term, if you take the five years, five years, uh, in line with your definition of price stability. Now, we'll, a word on resilience. Uh, in very turbulent times that we all have known, 
the uh, resilience of uh, the uh, currency itself and of the euro area as a whole uh, has been quite remarkable. Uh, I have to say that uh, when we had this uh, dramatic financial crisis, many of my friends were thinking, not in Europe, but on the other side of the Atlantic, or even perhaps on the other side of the channel, that we could not hold in such dramatic circumstances, the worst financial crisis since World War II. How could a new currency, starting from scratch a few years before, and uh, I would say a set of, uh, of countries uh, belonging to the euro area could not be dismantled or evaporate in such dramatic circumstances. And that was particularly true, of course, when the epicenter of the crisis at the moment of the morphing into a sovereign risk crisis was concentrating on Europe. Uh, and uh, I remember Ben Bernanke, another uh, delivery of, the, of this lecture, mentioning to me in Basel when we were to together, uh, Jean-Claude, now it's your turn. And he was alluding to the fact that the epicenter of the crisis, which was in New York, had crossed the Atlantic and came in Europe. Uh, and that was true, and a very good summing up, by the way, of the situation. So um, I would not elaborate too much on the reason why, in my opinion, we had to cope with this uh, sovereign risk crisis in Europe at uh, a moment of uh, great, great uh, difficulty. Uh, but let me only list that. First, uh, refusal to apply by the rule as regards the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, immediately after I was appointed myself, the, the three big countries in Europe decided that it, they would not apply to themselves the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. It was the case, surprisingly, of uh, uh, Germany, less surprisingly of France, and uh, less surprisingly, the chair of Italy. But the result was the three big countries didn't want uh, to apply by uh, those rules. Uh, second, there was no appropriate monitoring of the evolution of the cost competitiveness of member countries, and in particular, the sustained, persistent divergences of cost competitiveness, which were absolutely obvious, made very clear by the ECB in each of the Eurogroup meetings and uh, unfortunately was not corrected, was corrected only after the financial crisis erupted. Third, we had no banking union and it was certainly one of the reasons why we had uh, so many problems. We had no specific instrument to fight against speculation, no European stability mechanism at the moment of the crisis. We had very poor uh, implementation of uh, the needed structural reforms in Europe, and we didn't fully achieve the single market. All this taken together can explain why five countries, I'm oversimplifying, out of 15 were in a very difficult cir uh, circumstances. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the other 10 countries were not in a dramatic situation uh, explain why the complexity of the euro area was very difficult to decipher for, from the external observer. They had a tendency to say the euro area is in dramatic situation. It was true for, uh, unfortunately, five countries, but not true for the ten others. It was not necessarily true for the system as a whole, which was the average of those who were uh, in difficulty and those who were not in difficulty. So I draw your attention to the fact that um, one of the reasons why the judgment which was made on Europe at the time was so negative uh, was precisely this uh, optical illusion. Uh, all member countries were not in a crisis situation. I already uh, said that clearly. And the paradox, uh, by the way, was that amongst the constituency of the advanced economy, uh, some signatures were the worst possible inside uh, that constituency, when other ones were the best possible, <laughs> paradoxically. So the euro area was stretched, if I may, between the signature of, say, the Netherlands, Germany on the one hand, Greece on the other hand. The euro as a currency was reflecting the average situation of the euro area, 
and not only, of course, the part of it which was in crisis, which represented a minority. So first mistake, conf confound part of the euro area for the whole of the euro area. Second mistake was to underestimate the capacity of the euro area to be flexible, to correct its weaknesses in terms of economic governance, and to demonstrate both solidarity at the level of the area and strong national capacities to adjust with great difficulty and great pain in uh, the uh, crisis. So let me only mention that uh, uh, the SGP, the Stability and Growth Pact, was reinforced in this uh, difficult period uh, after having been weakened before. Uh, let me mention the fact that uh, the Fiscal Stability Treaty was signed and ratified when nobody would expect before the crisis that uh, we would have new treaties. The macroeconomic imbalance procedure was set up. I insist on that. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't hear too much about the MIP, which is as important as SGP in my own understanding because it's precisely the way you can monitor the evolution of cost competitiveness inside the euro area. And uh, uh, we had also created uh, the uh, uh, remarkable uh, um, uh, banking union, which is a very, very important uh, uh, new, uh, I would say, structural reform. And we created also the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, which is uh, 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 something which I just mentioned I, as very important, but we had also the European Stability Mechanism. And I will probably surprise you if I say that the European Stability Mechanism is the most important multilateral institution in terms of callable capital. The callable capital of, that, of the ESM is more than 700 billion euros, and uh, you have been yourself the boss Governor Kuroda, of a very important multilateral institution. You can see what it means to have a callable capital of uh, seven, more than 700 billion. Now, let me say a word on the popular support, which was also unexpected, that the euro area enjoyed. And that is something which uh, is uh, uh, quite, quite uh, important because, again, it was not anticipated at all. But if, when I look at the a very credible survey, which is called the Eurobarometer, I would say that uh, uh, we have uh, a comparison between the national institutions and the European institutions, which is much more in favor of the European institution that is, than is suspected. For instance, if I take the European Parliament confidence by the European citizens, uh, the European Parliament has the confidence of 48% of the European citizens vis-à-vis -vis 35 for the national parliaments. I was very surprised when I could see this uh, uh, result. And uh, for no confidence, it is even more dramatic. It is 39% of no confidence for the European Parliament versus 58% for the national parliaments. So the idea that uh, confidence has evaporated largely in all our advanced economies vis-à-vis -vis our national institutions is certainly true in all advanced economies, I would say, uh, certainly in the US, in the UK, in continental Europe, very much also. I don't dare uh, what I should say for Japan, but as regards Europe, continental Europe, it's clear that there is less rejection, say, uh, or more confidence in the European institution than is the case for the national institutions. Uh, and that explains, perhaps, both the resilience of the European project in the crisis, I already mentioned that, and that explains also the uh, fact that recently we had elections for the European Parliament which proved to be uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, impressive in terms of participation of the fellow citizens and also in terms of meditation and reflection on uh, democracy at the level of uh, the European Union as a whole. I mentioned the difference of uh, trust and no trust uh, for uh, the uh, Parliament. Uh, I could say the same paradoxically. The European Commission has more trust than the national governments. 
which again says a lot on the uh, frustration of our fellow citizens vis-à-vis their own institution, their own national institutions, and also again confirm that it is not this frustration is not targeted crucially, essentially uh, against uh, the uh, Europe, the European concept or the European institution. And uh, of course, uh, you will not be surprised, as a former uh, president of the ECB, to mention the fact that 75% of uh, citizens of the countries that are members of the euro area are approving, uh, 75% are approving the sentence, a European Economic and Monetary Union with one single currency, the euro, when 20% are against this sentence. Also, this popular support for the euro, which again was not necessarily anticipated or expected at the very beginning, is there, and it is quite uh, impressive. Uh, let me uh, say, uh, on top of the popular support, that uh, that, that popular support has been, uh, again, uh, demonstrated vis-à-vis -vis the euro itself very clearly, and uh, not only through the uh, figures that are impressive, 75 versus 20, that I just mentioned, but also when very important decisions were at stake, in Greece, the Greek people decided that uh, if it was a choice between staying or leaving, they would stay. And that was very, very clear in all uh, the survey. And uh, recently in Italy, we could so see also that uh, uh, when uh, the question was really asked whether we would leave or not, the response was no, it was no because it was not, uh, of course, the sentiment of a very large majority of the population. Now, uh, let, me, let me say just one word again on growth. I mentioned the fact that uh, growth was more flattering uh, in, uh, in the euro area than is generally recognized. It's very simple. I propose to you to compute growth in terms of growth per capita. I think it is just to compute growth per capita. By the way, in the case of Japan, it gives, of course, uh, taking into account demographics, figures that are very, very different from the figures that are generally uh, projected and discussed at a global level. In our case, and to make a very long story short, I would say that uh, according to the World Bank, since the inception of the euro, average growth per capita in the euro area was 1.1% since the inception, and average growth per capita in the U.S. was 1.2%. So there is an advantage for the U.S., but it's a very small advantage, as you can see. And when I look at the uh, figures that are coming from the IMF, I also have the same uh, demonstration that uh, we are uh, we grew over this 20-year uh, period approximately in terms of per capita growth at the same pace as the United States of America. So this is, this is certainly important and, of course, might explain also why resilience has been uh, demonstrated, why popular support is also there if the results in terms of real growth had been very uh, negative or extremely disappointing, we wouldn't say that. This is not to say that we are living in the best of the world possible. This is not to say that we should normally have not, not only to maintain uh, the uh, same uh, order of magnitude of growth per capita as in the US, but to catch up because we are below uh, the GDP per capita of the United States of America. And this is not to say that we could be satisfied with the present level of unemployment in Europe, which is unacceptable, uh, unacceptable compared, of course, with uh, the United States, also un unacceptable uh, compared with Japan. So a lot of hard work to be done, but again, uh, don't accept the idea, which is very often, uh, the, uh, I would say, considered as going without saying, that uh, we are uh, not growing at all, or that uh, growth per capita is uh, inferior, substantially, significantly inferior to what we are observing in other advanced economies. That being said, uh, I said already that uh, we had to nuance the uh, judgment on economic convergence between uh, member states of, uh, of the uh, euro area, member states 
of the economic union in general. We certainly have further significant progress to make. Also there, to make a long story short, I would say the, there is practically had been no rapprochement between the standard of living and the GDP per capita of the founding father of the EU, the, the, say the 11, 12 first countries. Uh, I say 12 because, as you know, Greece entered a little bit later in comparison with the uh, 11 first. Um, the real convergence in terms of uh, real economy, in terms of growth, has been observed for the newcomers. All the newcomers have converged towards the average of the founding uh, countries. And uh, so from that standpoint, one can say that uh, convergence is certainly a success, again, for all the countries that entered afterwards, Malta, Cyprus, uh, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, and uh, the Baltic countries. So that makes a lot of countries, including several former communist countries that have uh, participated actively in the convergence process. Uh, again, as I said already, less flattering for the first countries uh, that uh, went into the euro area. And that being said, uh, I have to say that we have to be very careful in this respect not to rise expectation uh, too much. Um, uh, when I look at the United States of America, which, as I said, is a 200 years uh, endeavor to create a single market with a single currency, I see between, uh, I would say, uh, Mississippi and Massachusetts approximately the same difference in per capita GDP uh, as we have between Greece and Germany. So to, to fancy that because you are in a single currency area, single market with a single currency area, you automatically have the benefit of uh, uh, convergence and uh, significant convergence to the extent that you should be at the same level is not true, obviously, not surprisingly so, because uh, real growth depends on productivity, real growth depends on the, <coughs> I would say, overall uh, uh, environment of, uh, of the particular economy concerned, and uh, that calls for uh, a lot of hard work to gain the capacity to grow faster and to embark on convergence. So I think, uh, again, perhaps the European were a little bit too rapidly and too quickly promising implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly, that convergence of the standard of living was part of the exercise. But that being said, uh, there is uh, there an important issue inside each country and between countries in the US as well as in Europe and this issue is inequality, obviously. It is recognized now at the global level that it is uh, extremely important, and this has to be countered as uh, decisively as possible. Uh, clearly, I already mentioned the frustration of a large part of our population in all advanced economies, uh, apart from Japan. Again, I'm, I don't judge uh, on Japan, but uh, as regards um, the UK, the US and uh, the European countries, clearly that frustration is visible. Again, as I said, not targeted against Europe in the case of continental European countries and Ireland, but still, of course, uh, that frustration is visible and uh, certainly associated with the kind of uh, inequality I just mentioned. So we have to strengthen the uh, economic, fiscal, and financial governance of the euro area. Let me go very rapidly on that because I would like to say a word on what I call conceptual convergence uh, inside uh, the constituency of the central banks of the advanced economy. Uh, to make a long story short there too, I would say we have to rapidly achieve what has already been decided as regards banking union, both in its deposit guarantee and single resolution dimensions, it's also necessary to eliminate the prudential obstacles that are still hampering cross-borders banking restructuring. There is, unfortunately, neither in the European Union nor in the euro area a genuine single market of banking services. The European banking sector is lagging behind the US banking sector. I would compare this unfortunate situation to what we are observing 
in the domain of digital, digital technologies and digital platforms. As a matter of fact, the lack of significant banking restructuring, both domestic and cross-border, explains largely the significant differences we observe on both sides of the Atlantic in terms of solidity and between the both sides of the Atlantic in terms of solidity and profitability. A second point which is very important is to apply seriously the provisions of the two main pillars of economic and fiscal governance, the Stability and Growth Pact, SGP, reinforced by the Fiscal Compact, and the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure I just mentioned already. Uh, clearly, clearly, uh, we have to recognize that spontaneously, those sustained divergences of cost competitiveness in a single currency area, which are the enemy of the single currency area, are not corrected necessarily uh, spontaneously by the functioning of market economy. As long as financing is there, if there is not a strict monitoring of uh, these persistent divergences, you accumulate the divergences until you have a crisis. This is really the lesson uh, from what we have observed uh, in the past uh, years. And I, am, I have to say very clearly that I think that we should be much more aware of that. The MIP has to be applied by the Commission uh, in, and by the Council in a way which should be very, very attentive, very serious, much more than is uh, presently done, in my opinion, again, in a single currency area. Uh, as long as you have a nice financing of your own economy, you do not necessarily see that you cannot correct your uh, divergences uh, because uh, there is no devaluation, there is no realignment possible in the single currency area. So you have to, to avoid to put yourself in a situation which would be uh, uh, potentially a very bad one in terms of next crisis. This is very, very important, not fully recognized in, uh, in the euro area, even after the crisis. And uh, again, uh, I draw uh, certainly the attention of all authorities in Europe on the importance of the, this MIP, Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure. Now, uh, we certainly have to improve the decision-making process inside the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, with the <coughs> introduction, in my opinion, of a qualified majority instead of unanimity, as is the case presently. And uh, uh, it, also, it is also to be noted that the importance and the size of the European Stability Mechanism, as I already said, is uh, very often underestimated. Uh, subscribed capital of 705 billion euros, I said more than 700 billion. Uh, which we have the international institutions which possesses the highest level of uh, subscribed capital. Now, uh, I call also myself for uh, have, having a Minister of Economy of the Euro area, which would preside over the Euro group of Ministers of Finance and would concentrate exclusively on the economic, financial, and fiscal governance of the Euro area without being simultaneously Minister of finance of a particular country. I really take it that this immense euro area, single market with a single currency, represents a, <coughs> a call for uh, any uh, president of the, of the euro group, which is gigantic. And if you want to be sure that you apply really all the governance which is necessary in this immense uh, single market, which is of the size of the United States, then you should not be both, I would say, Minister of Finance and uh, President of uh, the Eurogroup. Uh, I trust also that there is probably a case uh, to merge also that with some kind of position of Vice President of the Commission uh, on the model of the High Representative of Common Foreign and Security Policy, in order again also for the Commission not to be stretched between the euro area itself on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand, which is the case presently for the commissioner that, are, uh, that have the responsibility of the governance, <coughs> as I said, uh, in terms of economic, uh, fiscal, and financial governance. So there we probably have 
uh, changes that would be important if we want to be sure that the uh, governance of the euro area is optimal. We will see what happens. I don't uh, hide that uh, there is no uh, consensus in the present period for, uh, for that point. I would also call for reinforcing the democratic legitimacy of EMU by giving the last word to the members of the European Parliament, those that are elected in the euro area, in case there is a conflict between a particular government and uh, of a particular country and the European institutions. Say that uh, uh, country X refuses uh, to embark on the recommendations that are coming from the European institution uh, as regards, uh, for instance, the implementation of the uh, macroeconomic imbalance procedure of the Stability and Growth Pact or any other element that appears in the eyes of the of the uh, governance of the euro area as being very important, not only for the country concerned, but also for the stability of the whole. We knew that in the past. And uh, the fact is that when you have a conflict of legitimacy between the European institutions on the one hand and uh, the uh, national institutions on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, there is uh, no way to solve the problem uh, convincingly. So. Uh, in the past, we had the su successive happening of uh, meetings uh, at, the, at the level of, uh, of the uh, uh, European Council. And those successive happening were uh, not at all appropriate. Uh, the rest of the world was looking at the successive happening and thinking that perhaps you could have, uh, I would say, drama, absolute drama. And then it would have been considered the start of the famous dismantling of the euro area. Uh, if you say that, of course it needs a treaty, if you say that the last word belongs to the uh, elected representative of the euro area as a whole in close connection with the MPs of the countries concerned, then you have a democratic legitimacy for the final word. And it is justified because any particular problem grave, very grave problem in a particular country member of the euro area has repercussion on all the area and therefore it is not, uh, it is perfectly legitimate to ask uh, all those MPs that are representative of the area as a whole to say how they would solve this difficulty between one country and the European institution on the other hand. Uh, that, that, that is uh, something which uh, I trust is important because uh, this lack of democratic legitimacy is really a problem and uh, we should not neglect uh, the, the importance of this uh, uh, solving that, uh, that particular question. Now, decision in principle has already been taken by the European to have a budget of the euro area which could have various functions. We will see exactly what is decided. The decision has been taken in principle by the uh, countries concerned. And uh, there are several roles that the budget could play. Uh, it could finance public spendings that are national today. Of course, that would be the, the path towards more federal uh, spendings at, at the level of Europe as a whole. We could imagine that uh, uh, expenses in defense, security, border control could be of that nature. That's one. Nobody is, uh, to my knowledge, uh, calling for that at the present moment, but this is the perspective for a budget of uh, the European Union more than for the euro area. We could have a cushion, an anti-cyclical cushion. I have a preference for this, uh, for this idea because, of course, we have the cushion at the level of each particular nation, if they apply by the rule of the Stability and Growth Pact, to have some room for maneuvering in case there is uh, the downturn in, in, in the cycle or an asymmetric shock. Uh, but at the level of the EU area as a whole, we do not have an anti-cyclical function, that uh, cushion that would, uh, that would uh, function. So it seems to me that that could be appropriate Normally, it should not be organized as a transfer budget. It, would be, it should be organized at a budget which should accumulate uh, capital when uh, we are in the positive episode of the cycle and then spend 
when we are in the depressive episode of the cycle. We could also have a budget which would be earmarked to the financing of large pan-European uh, investment, uh, infrastructure, technology, R&D, and so forth, which would have or would be deemed to have a pan-European dimension. This is pretty possible, and uh, I would say uh, that uh, that uh, uh, kind of budget uh, is more or less what it seems the various governments have uh, in mind at the present period. And of course, uh, would, we could also have a budget which would help countries, members of the euro area that are badly in need of structural reforms and have a difficulty to proceed uh, and those structural reforms being deemed to create additional fiscal problems uh, that, that might happen uh, in certain cases. And then the um, budget would finance the, uh, those countries that would uh, embark on structural reforms. It's pretty possible that the final decisions which will be taken for the uh, concept of uh, the budget of the euro area would also take that uh, function into account. We will see. In any case, as I said, the European Council has taken a decision in principle to set up a budget, and uh, uh, we will, again, see whether, as I probably is guessing, uh, they would, uh, they would uh, uh, have the budget to finance pan-European investment on the one hand, and perhaps helping countries to proceed in appropriate, uh, um, I would say, structural reform. So as you see, uh, when I mention the uh, historic endeavor of the European, I have implicitly mentioned not only the uh, EMU, the European Union as a whole, where countries, members of the European Union, are attached, obviously, according to all surveys we are making, according to some of the attitude of, uh, of uh, national public opinion have been demonstrated in time of difficult time, time of crisis. Uh, I have also mentioned the support for, uh, for the EU area. I take it that um, we, we do not understand fully what's happening in Europe if we don't take into account other elements where you have, at the moment I'm speaking, also according to the Eurobarometer, a very large uh, cord by fellow citizens for proceeding. And surprisingly, we have an overwhelming majority to support a common defense and security policy. Uh, I was surprised myself because I was not expecting necessarily that would be backed by uh, our people. Even a common foreign policy, we, we are very far from a, for a common foreign policy, but that, that concept seems to be backed by a majority of the European citizens uh, at the level of the European Union as a whole. And uh, there is no doubt also that the idea of controlling our borders is something which is considered by fellow citizens as important. Problem is, how do you do that? <laughs> as well as how do you do the common security and defense uh, policy? But uh, th this idea that we are observing uh, historic endeavor that has many dimensions, even if it started in the economic field, as we know with the founding father, Jean Monnet, and uh, all the founding fathers, but we are now in front of something which is bigger and uh, has all good reasons to be bigger, taking into account the uh, overall changes of the global environment in all respect, economic and strategic. Now, let me uh, examine with you if, if the professor considers I still have a little time for my uh, expert. Ten minutes? Okay, fine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so uh, I, w I have mentioned the fact that I had observed a, a phenomenon of conceptual convergence of uh, policy making in advanced economies central bank. And I take it that uh, in this uh, dramatic event of 2007, for us it is in 2007 that the crisis started. In August 2007 we had to cope, with, to, to uh, embark on illimited supply of uh, liquidity at fixed rate, and we were asked the 9th of August 2007 in the ECB 
95 billion euros, so an enormous amount of liquidity, which was really for us the start of the crisis, not Lehman Brothers, but again, August 2007. But all central banks had the lucidity, and of course, uh, Bank of uh, Japan was the first, <laughs> a long time before, uh, to embark on bold and swift decisions. Uh, we were coping with the very different economies, significantly different financial structures, diverse historical and cultural backgrounds and conceptual references. One could have expected that under the pressure of our own economy's idiosyncrasies, the shock of the crisis would have accentuated the difference and given rise to an even more diverse set of decisions, of policy tools, and of instruments, also of concept of monetary policy, in a selfish, inward-looking mode. My own thesis is that contrary to what could have been expected and perhaps feared, central banks appear to be practically and theoretically significantly closer when confronted with the economic and financial crisis, phenomenon which was very spectacular almost immediately after the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy with the closest national central bank cooperation ever including through a multilateral network of swap lines. I'm speaking of the advanced economy central banks, uh, which remains a historical accomplishment. And also, of course, the level of close cooperation has also been symbolically illustrated by the coordinated decrease of interest rates that took place on October 8, 2008. Japan participated in this, not, not with the 50 basis point diminishing of the others for obvious reasons, but it was really all uh, uh, central banks of the advanced economy embarking on this symbolic demonstration of very close cooperation. The crisis also started or accelerated, in my understanding, a multidimensional process of convergence of key elements of thinking and making monetary policy. I uh, propose to call it a process of conceptual convergence. Of course, the obvious dimension of spectacular convergence triggered by the great financial crisis is the adoption of swift and bold, highly non-conventional measures. Governor Kuroda has mentioned that. Uh, the targeted purchases of treasuries, massive purchases of tradable public and private securities on the secondary market, full allotment of liquidity at fixed rate, uh, forward guidance, amongst uh, several other measures were decided in the recent years, still utilized by central banks, and you will discuss during these days here in Bank of Japan, uh, whether uh, it is now a permanent feature of uh, policy making, whether it is uh, only a transition, what is the new normal, uh, where, where are we going? But I take it that it is very important that it is not disputed that in the crisis and after the crisis, we, and we are still after the crisis with the overshadowing of the crisis among, uh, over us, uh, clearly, we had uh, a consensus to embark on these extraordinary measures, extraordinary non-conventional measures. So I don't elaborate more on that. It is the matter that we will discuss now. But let me also, on top of that, and I am speaking of most of the advanced economy, uh, central banks, not necessarily all central banks' economy, but I would say that uh, we have also converged on the best place for locating banking surveillance. Again, <laughs> it, it is the case on both sides of the Atlantic when we were profoundly divided before. Uh, we agree on the prevention of systemic risks. How do you do that in other, is another story, but it is recognized that central banks have a special responsibility in the prevention of systemic risks. We all agree on the concept of communicating uh, through press conferences, which was not at all the rule of the game before the crisis. Uh, it was the case in the ECB, but it was not the case in other uh, major central banks, it seems to me. And of course, la last but not least, the definition of price stability. So, uh, according to the professor constraint, I will concentrate on this last point. So, I let, uh, of course, all this is written in a paper, but let me concentrate on the definition of price stability because I consider it's quite impressive to see that 
15 years ago, only two central banks amongst the four major central banks of the advanced economy, say those who are issuing the currencies that are in the basket of the SDR, uh, we are mentioning a precise definition or target for price stability, the European Central Bank and Bank of England. Uh, both mentioned the 2% figures on CPI. For the ECB, as I already said, less than two, but close to two. And for BOE, it was uh, 2% on CPI since 2003, so a little bit later than in the ECB. At the time, neither the US Federal Reserve Board nor the Bank of Japan were signaling that price stability, their price stability definition of target. Since the decision of the Fed in 12 and the statement of the BOG in 13, all four central banks now mention the 2% figures, which has become, as a matter of fact, a global benchmark among all the large advanced economies. And that is something which I considered very, very important because it's a recent convergence, 13 for Japan, 12 for the Fed, and uh, it is also something which uh, uh, suggests that at the level of the core of the international monetary system, we have some kind of nominal anchor, 2% for inflation, which was not, did not exist, of course, since uh, World War II, or never existed by definition. So I, I was from time to time a little bit surprised that it was not noted more often as something which was important. I would say perhaps a, a powerfully symbolic illustration of the fact that uh, we had converged in the crisis, because all this is the period of the crisis. And my own understanding is that because de facto, uh, of course, each of us reasoning in its own uh, environment with its own responsibility given by its own country, its own legislation, uh, we uh, consider that more solidly anchoring expectations was really of the essence in turbulent times, in times where uh, markets, uh, participants, uh, and all, I would say, the other observers, institutions, and again, uh, uh, all over uh, each of our economy, were a little bit lost and had, uh, had the feeling that uh, everything was possible. Uh, so this uh, responsibility that uh, the central banks felt that they had a special dedication for more solidly anchoring expectations uh, was uh, illustrated, again, very, very clearly in this particular domain, which is a major domain of responsibility for central banks, even if uh, it is not necessarily in all central banks, the main goal, the main target, as is the case uh, because of the treaty and thanks to the treaty, in the case of the, of the ECB. So uh, my understanding is that we do not, uh, even if we still have difficulty, and it's obvious uh, in the case of some countries, and uh, certainly uh, less in the US, but more uh, in, uh, in Europe, and much more in Japan, there is uh, still a difficulty to solidly anchor inflation expectations in line with this definition. But it seems to me that uh, it is important that we reflect on what it means. And if there is confirmation, which I trust, of the 2%, at least in the US where they are reflecting, then it, it would probably mean that academia should reflect more of what it means at a global level. Uh, I also note, en passant, that, uh, but I don't draw a definitive conclusion from that, that in China also you have more or less hovering around 2% in the domestic economy of China. And uh, again, I don't draw definitive conclusion from that, but I know that en passant. That being said, it is clear that the central banks have real difficulty to attain their 2% targets. I already mentioned that, certainly at the level of some of the, of the major central banks. Many reasons have been listed to explain such a situation, including intensifying global competition, weak demographics, mediocre yearly increase of total factor productivity, which is, by the way, one of the most uh, of the major conundrum I see in the present 
global economy and also in the advanced economy, TFP is abnormally low, taking into account the, pro the uh, uh, science and technology uh, surges that we are observing. And uh, of course, secular stagnation is more or less a synthetic uh, concept combining several of the previous factors. But I would also note the anxiety of the labor force in rapidly changing production processes and restructuring in many sectors, driving workers and employees to concentrate mainly on preserving their jobs and much less on wages and salaries increases. In terms of real growth, the TFP conundrum is the real conundrum. In terms of nominal inflation, I would say the major problem is why are unit labor costs growing so miserably? And uh, it seems to me that uh, it is something which uh, we have to reflect more on because it's the main problem of the central banks, obviously, certainly in Japan, certainly also in Europe at the present moment. So uh, I take it that Japan is a case in point amongst a major advanced economy. It obviously has more difficulty than other major advanced economies to reach the target. And nobody can say that Bank of Japan did not do enough in terms of monetary policy, bold, audacious decisions. So other factors must be dominant. And I dare say that here in front of you, Governor Kuroda, I see mainly three of them. Firstly, I will mention the famous third row of the Japanese economic policy, namely structural reforms. It is clear that those structural reforms, seen from my own observation, have been implemented hesitantly and timidly. And they happen not to be the real game changer that was uh, expected and st is still to be expected. Secondly, I will stress demographics, which are very weak and are very clearly responsible for the large part of the abnormally low real growth, not real growth per capita, but real growth in absolute terms. Uh, that is in the medium and long term characteristic of the Japanese economy. And third, last but not least, the generalized absence of significant augmentation of nominal and real wages and salaries, despite the fact that full employment is ensured, uh, might be the dominant factor, as I already suggested. And then, of course, we are very, very much uh, out of the realm of the Bank of Japan monetary policy. It's, it's really up to the, um, I would say, uh, social partners, government and social partners, that uh, that uh, uh, rely the, re the main responsibility in this respect, because otherwise neither the government nor Bank of Japan would observe what they are aiming at. And uh, if I was bold enough to give advice <laughs> to the Japanese public authorities and to the private sector, I would say Bank of Japan is not the only game in town. Structural reforms of the economy remain of the essence, and joint efforts made together by enterprises, organized labor, and government to be, should be decisive to elevate unit labor costs yearly growth at a level which would be consistent with the 2% target of the central bank. And uh, uh, I will stop there, because again, I am under the strict constraint of the professor. Thank you for your attention.